Welcome to the Novel Idea Society. I am here, but I am in a room full of people. There's also people online as well. Um, and we're here to talk about your book, Moon of the Turning Leaves, but a lot of people also read Moon of the Crusted Snow. Um, I have a lot of questions, some of which I've already sent you over Facebook. You got to come along on the journey with me as I read this <laughs> book. Um, but a lot of people have asked me how to say your name um, and some questions about the language. So before we get into that, do you want to introduce yourself? I know you're not a fluid language speaker, but you do speak the language. So do you want to introduce yourself in your language? Yeah, yeah. Bonjour. Wabagishi, Kondishna Kaz, Makwat Nodem. Wasaksing Donjaba, Nishnabe, Minwa, Jaganashinda, Minwa, Swakamak Dida. And I just said, Hi everybody. Uh, my I, my name is Wab Gijik. I'm a member of the Bear Clan of the Anishinaabek of Wasaxing First Nation. Uh, Wasaxing is an island community near Parry Sound, Ontario. I'm of Anishinaabe and Canadian descent, and I currently live in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, and uh, you may call me Wab for short. That's cool with me. And I'm just really delighted to be with you all tonight. Uh, hugely honored that you've taken the time to read my book. And I'm just eager to answer any and all questions that you have. Okay, let me show you. There are, I promise there's real people here. There is a room. Of oh, people. nice. Hi, everybody. <laughs> cool. Right on. My talent is standing in front of the camera, not positioning it. Okay. Um, so uh, I did the thing that I don't normally do when I read the acknowledgments at the end of the book. Um, because after reading The Handmaid's Tale, I learned that I missed a whole plot point uh, at the end of the book. So now I read the acknowledgments of everyone's book, just in case. Yeah. Um, and this book was never in your original plans. No. No, I uh, wrote Moon of the Crested Snow, you know, while I was working at CBC in Ottawa, you know, sort of in in my spare time and I was able to take a couple of leaves of absence while I was working as a reporter too. Uh, CBC was very gracious and generous in giving me those leaves. Um, but uh, it was, it was a lot of work to, you know, try to be a novelist while being a journalist at the same time. And Sam, you know, you know, the routine, it's uh, a very intense job. Um, and, and, you know, the book itself was a long time in the making. Um, you know, I first started thinking about it, like, way back in 2003 uh it was inspired by what was called the northeast blackout of 2003 and there's a sort of longer story connected to that that we can get into later um but it, it was just my i think attempt at writing a post-apocalyptic story from a Anishinaabe perspective and i was uh satisfied with the job i did you know i i felt like i fulfilled the vision that i had and i never intended there to be anything beyond that first book, uh, I saw it as, you know, very much like the characters riding off into the sunset, you know, going off on their own journey. And and I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll just leave that there. But when it was published in 2018, and I started doing public events, uh, people would ask me if I was ever considering writing a sequel. And at first, I was just, I would just be brutally honest and say no, because I wasn't at all. And then I'd notice uh, their disappointment whenever I'd say that. Uh, so after a while, I thought, okay, I, I got to at least think about something or, or just tell people that maybe I'm thinking about it, right? And as as the months went on, the more I thought about it. And then about a year after Moon of the Crest of Snow was published, I had partnered with the, my agent by then, and she convinced me to think up a solid idea and told me that she could get me a meeting with a potential home for it. And, and the rest is history pretty much. So do you read apocalyptic fiction or like, where did this, I know you say it's inspired by an event that actually happened, but mm. is, are these the kind of things, I don't want to say that give you joy, but <laughs> I mean, some of us like the dark and twisty things. The last yeah. of us is a really successful TV yeah. show for a reason. Um, but is, are these the kind of things you read and consume yourself? Yeah, I do. Um, not uh, totally, you know, I like to mix it up with what I read as much as possible. But since I was a teenager, um, reading books like 1984 and Brave New World and Fahrenheit 451 and, you know, The Crystal Lays, Lord of the Flies, 
that that we read in high school back in the 90s in Ontario. Uh, I really enjoyed those books. Uh, and I think that really, I think, piqued my initial interest in the genre. And, and I would sort of dip in and out of it throughout, you know, um, my 20s and so on. Um, but it wasn't until I read The Road by Cormac McCarthy that I really thought, you know, I, I want to try this on my own, you know. And and I read that about five years after that blackout happened. And uh, yeah, it sort of really got the wheels turning for me. And, and when I decided that, you know, I was going to get into that genre or try to create that kind of world or situation, then I started reading, you know, a bit more and, and then, you know, uh, watching movies and series and so on. Uh, so I still, yeah, I, I think I, I, I'll read a, a, a few a year at least in, in that genre um, because I just really enjoy other people's takes on the future, you know, and, and I think the genre itself is changing a lot. You know, it's not so much like here's the doom and gloom after the end of the world. And here are these like one or two people trying to survive or trying to be heroes. Uh, I think we're seeing a wider offering of perspectives on what that future could look like. And uh, I'm just really honored and, and privileged to be able to contribute to that. Okay. So tell me about this blackout because mm -hmm. in Saskatchewan, we have our own infrastructure issues, yeah. but tell us about this blackout in Ontario that, that inspired this? Yeah, uh, I was uh, living in Toronto at the time. It was about a year after I graduated from university. I was working as a freelance journalist there. And uh, I was asked by my dad and stepmom to go house it for them on the reserve in, in Wasoxing, where I grew up, which is about a two hour drive north of Toronto. Uh, and they asked my one of my other brothers who lived in Ottawa to come and house it too because our our youngest brother lived with them. He was just fourteen at the time, so it was an opportunity just for the brothers to be together, you know, house sitting for a week, and you know, it was a nice opportunity, right? Uh, and it was on the Thursday of that week. Uh, the date was August fourteenth, two thousand three. Um, we're just hanging out at our dad's place, and uh, the power went out. And we thought, okay, that's kind of weird because it's like a sunny summer day. Uh, there's no storm or anything like that. Uh, and, but we didn't think too, too much of it after that until, you know, the afternoon went on and uh, we couldn't watch TV or play video games and we got bored. So we got in the car and we drove into Perry Sound, which is only about a 10 minute drive away. And when we got there, we saw that uh, the power was out as well. You know, all the traffic lights were out, stores were closed because they had no power. And we thought, oh, it must be a big deal if the power is out in town too, not just on the res. And we saw some buddies of ours on the main street in town and we stopped and talked to them. And one of them had heard on the radio that it was this widespread blackout, that all these big cities like Toronto, Ottawa, uh, Boston, Cleveland, New York, mm -hmm. Detroit, uh, a big stretch of Northeastern North America was in the dark and nobody knew why. And nobody knew when the power was going to come back on. So immediately my brothers and I like went into survival mode because we thought like it was, it was the big one. And it could have been because like the video games or movies we were watching at the time. Um, but we got in the car and drove back to the res and started thinking up a survival plan. And when we got back to our dad's place, we started like taking an inventory of all the cans in the cupboard. And, you know, we looked in the fridge to see what was going to spoil. And we went out to the backyard to collect firewood because, you know, the electric oven in the kitchen was useless. Uh, and we, you know, went and checked in on our grandmother and some other relatives and so on. And then as, as the night fell, uh, we were talking about what we were going to do the next day. And, and we thought, oh, yeah, we'll go check back in on these family members. And, you know, let's go ask our Uncle Jim if he has some live bait we can use. And let's go talk to our Auntie Elaine to see if she has, like, you know, anything that can help us, you know, drink water in case, like, we have, you know, diminished supply or whatever else. And the more we thought about it, we we're like, holy geez, you know, we're surrounded by resourceful people here on the res, you know, where electricity has only been here for like two or three generations, you know, and everybody knows how to hunt and gather and, and live off the land. And we don't really need any of that stuff. We don't need our cell phones. We don't need, you know, electricity. And the more we thought about that, the more comforting it was to be on the res in what we thought was an apocalyptic moment, right? 
Um, so it was, it was, yeah, we slept really soundly that night, you know, juxtaposed against hours earlier when we thought like the whole world was, was ending <laughs> pretty much, you know? Uh, so we woke up the next morning and, uh, we're, we're getting ready to go fishing. Cause we're like, Oh, like fish is on the menu forever now. You know, we're not getting any like, uh, cuts of steak <laughs> in from uh, the city or anything like that, you know? Uh, but right when we're about to leave the house, the power came back on turned on CBC on the, on TV and saw the footage coming in from all the, all over the place. And like, it wasn't outright chaos anywhere, but it was still, you know, tense, you know, there were, you know, panic buying at grocery stores, there were empty shelves and people lined up at gas stations and, and, you know, it was, it was a little hairier in the city. Right. So I thought like, wow, if this kind of thing ever happens again, I definitely want to be back here on the res and not in Toronto for sure, you know? And and the more I thought about that, I went back to Toronto a few days later to go back to work and, and you know, it was still kicking around in my mind. And I thought, you know, it'd be really cool to write about that someday, somehow, um, whether it be a short story or maybe I can like um, do a documentary about that or something. Um, and, and when I, it was when I read the road about five or six years later was when the wheels really got turning from there, but yeah, it was an actual blackout that, uh, that started this whole thing. Were you disappointed when the power came back on? Um, yeah, a little bit <laughs> oddly to say, um, cause it was like, yeah, for, for us brothers, you know, it was, it was, you know, a really close moment, you know, cause the three like of a us bonding had, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It was a bonding opportunity for sure. And, and, you know, we, we hadn't lived in the same place for a long time. You know, I was in Toronto. My other brother was in Ottawa and our youngest, our youngest brother was still on the res. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, and it was cool. It was like a, a family bonding moment too. And, and it was really like, in, in some ways, as, as short as it was, you know, it wasn't even a full day where we were. Um, it was like a, a strong reconnection with our community and the land around us, too, you know. So so I do have fond memories of that. And obviously I do because like writing about it has has changed my life, too, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I look back on that moment. Uh, yeah, one of the major moments of my life for sure. Is there anyone on the res that reads the book and says that wouldn't happen that way? We wouldn't do that? Um. No, not really. I think like, because I set the res in the story, like, so far away from where we actually are. And that was <laughs> one of my first um decisions, actually, you know, I, I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna write about a res like ours. That's, you know, right beside a town only two hours north of Toronto. Um, but the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, this story would be over way faster than if I put it in a more remote place, because, you know, we get that glimpse in Moon of the Crested Snow, for those of you who have read it, um, of the chaos in the city where when those two young students come back uh, come back up north, right? And I thought, yeah, if it's going to be like that close to a town or a city, then there's going to be outright chaos right away. And it won't. It wasn't as compelling to me to to write sort of that chaos end of the world story. I wanted to write something a little more of a slow burner um, with some creeping tension, and and that's why I put it like in far northern Ontario, right? So when people back home read it, they recognize like. They see the familiarity and like the slang and like the interpersonal dynamics and the size of the community and so on. Um, but that community in the story is way up north and, and you know, it's uh, fly in only for for the most part, you know, with this this one service road and so on. So they know they, they see that difference. But um, I think what they really do like to connect with is just those. Um, nuanced details about Anishinaabe life, uh, which I try to capture. So, um, so yeah, they they don't like equate it right away with our home community, but they equate the the sort of cultural details for sure. You use a lot more language. Like, there's a lot of Anishinaabe language in Moon of the Crested Snow, but there's way more hmm. in Moon of the Turning Leaves. Did you make that decision consciously as you got more comfortable with it, like writing? Oh about yeah. It? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, it was really important for me to to, to have it, the language in Moon of the Crested Snow. And and even in my first two books, uh, Midnight Sweat Lodge and Legacy, there's a bit of, of the language in that, too. Um, but I've worked harder as an adult to, so, to sort of reconnect with it and to, and to learn it more properly. Like I learned quite a bit as a kid, but I never learned it fluently. Right. Um, and then moving away and then just becoming a journalist and so on. Like you just I move farther and farther from the language. Right. Um, so trying to capture it in like my fiction has been really important just to have it represented, you know, in, in an English text. 
but yeah, between those those two books, there's definitely a, a bigger leap, I think, because you know, my skills have improved between both books for sure. But also, you know, the future I wanted to create in Moon of the Turning Leaves is one where they're able to uh, more, um, they're able to connect with it a little more. They're sort of liberated from the oppression of the state and they can really work hard to try to reclaim their language, although they don't totally get there, right? Um, but I, I wanted to show the language much more strongly in, in the second book. And also it's a longer book too, you know, so it's about a third longer than, than, than moon of the crested snow. So there's more opportunity, there's more space, um, for that linguistic representation and, and just to backtrack a bit, you know, I, w I was really, um, empowered by the editor of moon of the crested snow, uh, her name's Susan Renouf, um, when I gave her the first draft of, of the story, um, all the instances of the Anishinaabe language were in dialogue, right? And, and in that first draft, every character that spoke in the language would repeat the same thing in English right after, like as if to translate it. And she said, you know, in, in reality, that would never happen. That's redundant because, you know, that person would the person they're speaking to would understand that. And she said, you don't have to do that in for the sake of the reader. You know, you can find ways to translate it through action, through the English responses of, of other characters in dialogue or through other contextual ways. Right. Or you don't have to translate it at all. You know, let the reader try to figure out what's going on. So to have uh, like a white woman in her 60s from Toronto tell me that was was awesome. You know, it, it was like, OK, here's a veteran of the industry saying, you know, leave your language in there as proudly as possible. And I was able to carry that sort of uh, sentiment into the second book, too, um, with with a new publisher and a new editor. Right. But who knew that, you know, that was of great importance to me to, to convey the language. So, yeah, it was a conscious decision uh, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I'm just happy that. Uh, I was able to put as much in there as possible. It's interesting you say that because I noticed that there weren't as many translations in Moon of the Turning Leaves, but I also found I still knew what was going on. <laughs> cool. So I wasn't I wasn't confused by any of that. Um, do you have any spe special connection to the names that you chose for your characters other than that they're culturally significant to your culture? I just um... used through like three times in there but you know what i mean <laughs> i was i was following you it's all good <laughs> um you know uh i think partially um you know i i really wanted to sort of also demystify some of that because i think uh you know a, a trope amongst i think some stories or or movies done by uh non-indigenous creators you know there are there are these like spiritual or mystical names that the indigenous characters have right where we're in reality you know we would just have names about like the sky or a tree or an animal or whatever else right so so that's why a lot of the names are pretty basic like nangos means little star maingan means wolf uh onaquit means cloud uh, Gijik means sky. Um, so Dindisi means uh, blue jay. Um, so yeah, you know, I wanted to show that in that sense. But it, there are also like some shout outs to people here and there. You know, I have a niece whose whose name is Nung, which is star. So Nungos is sort of a play on that, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just, you know, showing, you know, how our names can exist. Uh the, the 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 I think most humorous example is is not one of the Nishnabe names, but it's one of the the translated names like Evan White Sky, his last name. Um, White Sky is my name translated, Wabigije, right? Uh -huh. um, and, and when I was writing the first book, I was coming up with this cast of characters, and I was like, oh man, there's so many here now. I gotta start giving them last names so that people can differentiate between the families. So. I was like, all right, what am I going to give Evan? You know, just as a placeholder, I'll give him White Sky, you know, which is my name. And, you know, the months went on and I was working on this draft and I, I totally forgot to change it back because I'd gotten used to his last name being White Sky. Uh, so, yeah, White Sky is my name translated. But, like, I, Evan is not based on me at all. Evan is a character that, you know, I would aspire to be like. You know, he's a... Um, I guess a combination of a few people in my life that I really admire and, and look up to. 
Uh, but that's always funny to reflect upon now that we're two books into Evan being there and like that name uh, not being what I intended at all for him, you know? So uh, yeah, it, it makes me chuckle still. Okay. I might be the only one who thought this, but I thought he died at the end of the first book. Oh, so yeah. when he came into the second book, I was like, he lived? Did I miss <laughs> something at the end of the book? Because obviously he gets shot. And I mean, you yeah. make the joke about him getting shot again. I mean, if people are here, they know what happened. So spoilers. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I really, I was surprised, like pleasantly surprised to see him in the second one because I was assuming the family was going to have to go on without him. Mm. Yeah, that was like a, you know, a cliffhanger on purpose. You know, I, I I liked being able to add a bit of mystique there around around him. Um, you know, when he gets shot at, uh, I think he gets shot at three times, but you don't know how many times he's hit or where he's hit, right? And then in the second one, he he they mentioned a scar he has up near his collarbone, which is the only place where he actually got hit. So I left that vague on purpose because, you know, I, I like that kind of drama or mystery in a story. But uh, when I, I was sharing, you know, the early drafts with friends uh, who are also authors, uh, Richard Van Camp, uh, the Tlitch Odeni author from from up north, um, a, an earlier draft was like way more ambiguous than the one that's been published. Right. And and he he called me after he read it and he's like, uh, so what's going on with Evan? Like, is he alive or is he dead? And I said, well, he's alive. And he's like, well, you got to hint a little more in that direction, right? Because right now it's so ambiguous that I think it's going to be more frustrating than anything for the reader, right? So I just added a little bit. Um, when they're in that epilogue of the first one, when they're getting ready to go to the new settlement, I think I just added um, when, when Nicole says, um, we're going to go see daddy. He's waiting for us. Um, she doesn't say that before. Uh, so that's her saying, like, we're going to go actually see him in the flesh. And some people think like, oh, that's I took it as, like he died and they were going to a cemetery. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> And, and that's, that's totally, totally uh... the journalist in me just assumes the worst. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that that's a fair interpretation um, but like uh, it's funny that this is such a um, a subtle revelation for you all that uh, not many people would get um, in, in our community where I'm from, you know, we, we bury our dead, right. Um, a funeral takes four days. It's a very uh, intense, uh, but meaningful, right. Uh, but when we actually bury somebody, like we believe that's just their vessel. Um, we don't I believe got that from the story. Like that very much was like reflected in the story in the way you write about the characters that died. Yeah, yeah. And and their spirit goes on to the spirit world, right? So where I'm from, we don't go to people's graves to visit them. Like we, we visit them like in our prayers or in our dreams or when we're giving thanks by a tobacco offering or whatever else, right? So that her saying we're, we're going to go see him, that's her meaning we're going to go see him with a beating heart in the flesh kind of thing, right? So, so yeah, that that's just, and I wouldn't expect it anybody this to is get white that. people problems well that's <laughs> this is white people problems but that's like yeah it's just like one of those little internal things that you can write for for your people i guess you know so uh but yeah like now that the second book's out and you know his name is on the back cover and everything like that like it's he's obviously you should have read the back of the book <laughs> <laughs> See, I did. I read the back of the book, picked the book, then read Moon of the Crested Snow, or read, yeah, Moon of the Crested Snow, then yeah. read this. Clearly forgot everything about the back. It's of the good book. though. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> so but let's also start like, how, sorry, sorry, just uh, no to add, like the way he's revealed in in the second book is kind of a play on that too. Like it's like, oh, you thought he was dead, but like here he is, kind of thing, right? It's like he comes down that little slope to help Nungos with the fish. Uh, coming out of the boat kind of thing so like he, you don't see him right away in the story um, and that was intentional too just to have him say just to have him be just be present once again you know so I want to talk about her as like a strong female character because I love her for that but first I want to talk about your writing style because if I don't I will forget um, are you a person that plots everything out or do you fly by the seat of your pants and see where you land no, I, I plot everything out. And I think that's probably from being a journalist. Uh, you know, I, I when I worked like to deadline, I always wanted to have everything lined up before I actually went out and gathered or, or wrote or anything like that. Right. 
And then when I started, you know, trying to become a fiction writer um, in my spare time as a journalist, I think I applied that same kind of approach to it, mostly because I had such limited time. So I thought, you know, I have to have a really strong sense of the story. I have to really have it nailed down from start to finish um, before I start writing it, because I don't have time just to sort of, um, you know, fiddle with things as I go, you know, like I have to make the most of this, like, hour that I have before I go to bed or whatever or you know the two hours on a Saturday afternoon between going to the grocery store and and working out or whatever else right so so yeah I always always plot everything out from start to finish um write out these very detailed character descriptions of each person um do like pretty thorough research into like the setting or any other sort of background research I need to do, whether it's like scientific or geographic or or, or historical or anything like that, right? Uh, and and I feel like I I need to have a strong understanding as possible of the story before I I start putting like the prose together, you know. Um, and that's just how it's worked for me. Uh, I would like to try like going off the seat of my pants at some point just to just to see how that goes. But something like Moon of the Turning Leaves, especially, um, had to follow such, I think, a strict timeline that I really felt more comfortable just planning it all out. Right. Plus, it it, it had this whole other backstory that I had to factor into it, too, in these very, I think, delicate, um, but very strategic ways, too. You know, so, yeah. Uh, a lot of planning from start to finish before actual writing. It's interesting to me how you hit like, and I say this because I watch a lot more apocalyptic stuff than reading it, uh, but how you hit like vibes of The Walking Dead, of The Last of Us, like some of those really popular shows that have the really bad thing, whether it's zombies or whatever you want to call the things in The Last of Us. I'm sure they have a name, but I can't remember what it is. But the bad things in your stories are people. And so it was interesting to me how you managed to work in that tension of like when I when I thought of the disciples, it reminded me of like, did you watch The Walking Dead before I start going down this rabbit hole? Yeah, yeah, I, like, I didn't like I, Negan I didn't watch... vibes when Negan was the bad guy yeah. and all of them started because they were the bad humans to the good humans. Right. Type thing. Like I picked up the that that vibe, but was it hard for you to constantly try and come up with new villains in ways that were like believable in a way that they weren't super, super, super bad zombie villains? I am not articulating myself here, but you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the biggest challenges with the second book for sure. Uh, the first book has just one guy, like the solitary villain, you know, which is pretty basic and, and, really straightforward to get to you know like the first book really is a story about good versus evil you know evan versus justin scott you know even though evan is not evan is just like one representative of the whole community right uh and and uh, it's about like the moment right the um, the moment in the immediate aftermath of the cataclysm and the struggle between good and evil and and i i think like that's an easier story to write and looking at a sequel, which is the long aftermath, um, long after the world has sort of resettled into something new but mysterious, uh, it's harder to figure out what all the different forces at play are, especially the antagonizing forces. So I, I thought long and hard about what a bad guy or bad guys plural would be or what they would look like, right? Uh, and and I thought, you know, because this is the aftermath, um, you know, survival is still the priority for, for everybody, but people have managed to accomplish that and establish their new societies or settlements or whatever else. But, you know, a lot of these people have done that at the expense of others, even the good, so-called good guys. And there are some moral ambiguity ambiguities at play, right? There, there are some moral gray areas that people have explored to survive and to create their new happy, healthy places, you know? Uh, and, and I think the, you know, it's a very fine line between good and evil in that long aftermath, right? And we see that in some characters like, like Javdis, who we see later on, you know? 
Um, so yeah, thinking about the bad guys, the disciples in particular, I just thought, you know, I can't have just one bad guy. I'm going to need to have like a group of them. And I just thought like, what scares me right now in 2020, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was dreaming it up and it's, it's neo-Nazis who are heavily armed. Like that's what scares me first and foremost. Right. And we see these dudes being empowered by all kinds of authorities and influential voices and so on. And, and these are people who would relish at the opportunity to violently you know, uh, change the world to, to sort of, um, you know, take, uh, to, to sort of harness like that moment of a cataclysm. Right. And when I was like, when I was dreaming these guys up, um, you know, I know a lot of prepper people, you know, just, just cause I live in Northern Ontario. I think a lot of people out, out West there would know people in their communities who are, are ready for whatever kind of cataclysm could happen. That That's not outside the realm of possibility, but there's a more extreme way to take that. And you don't have to look far on YouTube to find those guys. And, and that's where, that's where I looked for them. And it was an eye-opening and very troubling sort of YouTube rabbit hole that I went down for about a month. Um, just looking at the, the the prepper guys who were getting ready, you know, who were stockpiling ammo, who would take their cameras and go down into their basement and just go through their bins of different rounds of ammo, basically stacked from floor to ceiling and then pan over to show like their walls of of firearms all kinds of assault rifles and everything else and then go back into their pantry to show like all the rations they've stockpiled and you know all the non-perishable food and all that right and and there's lots of these guys who are just showing you what they're prepared for and how they're going to do it and uh you know one of the most chilling aspects is like they believe that ammo is going to be currency that that's how they're going to, you know, barter for food or transportation or whatever else. Right. Um, and, and there's an acronym that you can just type into YouTube is S H T A F S H T F sorry, which means shit hits the fan. So if you just type that into YouTube, you see all these dudes and all their plans. Right. So that totally messed up like my YouTube algorithm for months, you know, <laughs> I couldn't just go look up like funny videos after that. I had to like cleanse it, you know, uh, but yeah, that's that's sort of the backstory behind those guys, and yeah, it was it was like a an interesting exploration into the, you know just the morals around the end of the world, you know. So, hey, let's talk about Nungos because she she's like an Ariana Stark character to me. Oh, like cool. she's she's so good. I am getting so caught up on my pop culture. I feel proud that I used that reference properly. <laughs> um, I just finished Game of Thrones like a week ago. Um, but such a good, young, strong female character that doesn't fall into those like traditional female norm traits, mm. but also has those moments of like the connections to her family and to her dad and everything else. Where did you draw her personality from? Because I always find it interesting when men or women write really strong characters of the opposite gender mm -hmm. in a story that's a main character. Yeah. Oh, it was it was a challenge for sure. Uh, I think I, I came to the decision of having her at the center of the story uh, pretty early on. Um, when I, you know, thought of putting the story that far into the future, um, Evan was always going to be there on this quest, right? And, you know, I thought, okay, it's going to make sense to have one of his kids join him because they'll be teenagers at this point in, in their lives, right? So I think like the first thought for a lot of people, especially men would be, oh, yeah, let's have the son go. And, you know, it would be like a father son buddy adventure story. Um, but that didn't interest me at all. Uh, I thought, you know, that's been done. Um, like, uh, who really is going to want to read that? And immediately I thought, okay, well, I'll make Mind Gun be a new dad. So he has to stay home. He has these new responsibilities. He, he can't go on this quest. So Nungos is going to be it. And the more I thought about that, the more exciting it became, um, just for so many reasons, as as you said, you know, the, the biggest one is having a strong female lead character. And um, I'm a dad to three boys. So I think it's my responsibility, you know, as a story creator to show them what a strong female character can be and how it's my responsibility as a man to try to uh, uphold that, you know. 
but then, you know, getting into the head of a 15 year old girl as someone, you know, in his early to mid forties is pretty challenging. Right. Uh, but you know, the more I thought about the people in my life, like I have nieces and cousins who are teenagers who, you know, live both on the res and in the city. Uh, so I'm, I'm in touch with them all the time. I know like what, you know, their hopes and dreams and values are. Um, but what's most, I think, influential, what was most influential for me in creating her was just knowing about all the efforts of young Indigenous women everywhere who are really uh, reviving a lot of traditional practices, you know, who are eager to get back out into the bush, uh, to learn how to hunt, to learn how to fish, to, you know, harvest medicine, to learn how to tan hides and so on. You don't have to look far to see these efforts. And and yeah, I, I know for sure they're happening out there in Saskatchewan. They're happening basically everywhere, right? And you can see this happen on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever else. And it's like, okay, this is totally within our current reality that young indigenous women are, are leading the way in, in this, in these various realms out in nature with all this land-based knowledge that they're regenerating. Right. So yeah, from there, it was like, it was empowering for me, you know, like as, as an uncle, as a community member, you know, as an older cousin to, to, you know, be able to pay homage to the young women in my life and to try to, you know, properly and respectfully represent them, you know? So, so yeah, there was a lot that went into that and it was just, to me, um, yeah, it was probably the most rewarding part of writing the story for sure is writing her. I think you did a good job. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, did you have dreams about this place? Because uh, it has been a very long time since I have, re I read 90% of the second book in a day because after every chapter, I was like, but I need to know what happens next. <laughs> I need to know what happens next. And I found myself really invested in the setting and the characters and what was happening and the whole journey. Did you have dreams about this as you were writing this? Yeah, I did. You know, um, that's uh, because I don't have to worry about spoilers that that death dream that Evan has where he's like, He's jumping along the shoreline, uh, you know, looking at the big bay and looking at the the other side and so on. I had a dream of of that specifically, and I was like, "Holy shit, that is!" Uh, that, <laughs> it was quite vivid and quite profound, and and I thought, you know, like, well, what does that mean first and foremost? But um, where does that fit into the story that I'm creating? And I thought, you know, this is. Uh, at the point where Evan is is about to transition out of his life and where he's accomplished this this great feat for his family and his people, he's been granted the gift of this wider perspective that, you know, he could have never imagined that was essentially taken from him and from his ancestors, right? So as he's dying, he's he's being able to see this the, the whole landscape, you know, of his homeland, of of his traditional territory and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's that's sort of how that generated for me um, um, as I was like dreaming up the story. But uh, you know, walking through the bush and you know being along the shore of a lake, um, you know, I still do that a lot. You know, I grew up doing that. Um, in, in the middle of writing the story, I'd just be like, "Oh, I got to go walk in the bush for a while." You know, I I gotta I gotta feel what these these walkers are feeling. You know, I gotta like step over this thick brush and I gotta like traverse these rocks because like where we are here, it's, it's all rocky landscape, right? So um, yeah, it was it was a lot. It was a mixture, I guess, of of you know dreaming and of like just getting myself out there too. Okay, I sent you a message about this on Facebook because um, and I I've had many conversations with people since they finished these books, um. TV show, movie, <laughs> something like this needs to be a show or a movie. Oh, that, that would that would be so cool. Yeah, you know, um, there the first book was optioned uh, by a producer, and he wanted to make it into a series, but just a variety of things kept that from happening. Uh, the pandemic being one of the big ones, you know, um, and and yeah, it just wasn't the right sort of. I think, um, yeah, it just wasn't the right uh, combination. Time. Yeah, yeah, and not the right time, right? So that option has since expired, and you know the the rights have been reverted to me. Uh, but now that the new one's out, hopefully there'll be an opportunity to 
uh, package both books into maybe a two season series. Um, because yeah, it would be, you know, I, I like feature films. I, I like seeing how books can be adapted into a very concise, like one and a half to two hour package. But, you know, this day and age with, um, you know, the success of so many different series and, and just seeing how they're treated and, and adapted, uh, it would be cool to see, to see them both as, as a series of, of sorts. Right. And like, you know, I'd, I'd read Station Eleven a few years ago, and then I watched the series, and, and I just loved seeing it come to life in that way. I did. I watched The Last of Us, but not until after I was finished writing Moon of the Turning Leaves. But it blew me away because I was like, wow, you know, these these are a lot of the things that I was trying to get at with writing mm -hmm. that story, you know, and I just I just absolutely love that series, too. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully someday we'll see. Do you so we've seen so many more indigenous actors blowing up in indigenous roles as they should do you have certain actors and actresses in your mind for who you would want to play certain characters like you see them as they would be like yeah that person needs to play that role <laughs> it's funny because like when when i was envisioning these characters uh like i see like people from my community right or i see people who look like them or like where where we live now in Sudbury, it's this this whole area, the North Shore of Georgian Bay slash Lake Huron, um, the Nishnabe that we're descended from. We're all we, we we have a similar look, right? So that's the kind of people I see, and I don't know many movie stars who look that way. So it's it's hard to envision it in that sense. But recently, uh, I can't remember if it was on Facebook or Twitter. Someone's like, oh, you know, like. It'd be so cool to see Lily Gladstone play Nicole, and and that just like blew my mind. I was like, holy shit, yeah, that's sort of how sort of how I picture. Her. But but Lily Gladstone, she's gonna win the Oscar, so she's gonna be too big for <laughs> my series if it ever comes out, right? But uh, yeah, so it, you know, the, it, it's kind of cool to start imagining, and that's just because there's so many more Indigenous actors coming into prominence now, right? I think you know I will be able to like visualize that as as the years go on. Okay. Um, I can ask questions all day. I come by it honestly, but I feel like it would be nice to let some of the people who've come to see you talk uh, can ask some questions. We also have uh, some people online. Uh, we have one person left online. The rest are us. Um, so if you have a question online, just put up your hand. Uh, if not, I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see these beautiful people. Boop, 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 boop. boop. Eh? Oh, it is so crooked. I am so sorry. Okay. Eh? There's a reason I don't operate. <laughs> okay, there's more people. That's the best it's going to be. Okay. Who has a question for Wong? Because he can now see you, so the pressure is on. <laughs> you might have to come closer because I don't know if he'll be able to hear you from there. You can even come right in front. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Um, this, I kind of have a two-parter, it might be related or not. I'm curious about the dedication huh. in the book and what you mean by help you out of the darkness. Oh, well, our, our son, our second son, Yabe, uh, he was born in June of 2020, uh, like two, three months into the pandemic. And, and I think we all remember what that first spring and summer were like during the pandemic. Uh, it was really hard. Um, yeah, we had, we had a very difficult time, you know, our, our eldest son who was three and a half then he really struggled in those first months of the pandemic and, and we all did as, as a result, but we were really fortunate that we had this baby coming, you know, my wife was pregnant, uh, you know, you know, six, seven months pregnant when the pandemic was declared. So, uh, as you know, we were totally stressed because we're like, how is this going to happen? We don't know how, you know, she's going to give birth in the hospital with this plague happening, but it, it, it all worked out really well. Like I was, I was able to be in the room when she was, when he was born, our son. Um, and, and yeah, it just like, you know, brought, I uh, just brought everything into such uh, powerful and necessary focus for us. And, you know, uh, a baby is just such a celebration. And, you know, our second coming at that time was just like such a, a gift, you know, such a blessing. And it really helped us pull through that 
that first year of the pandemic. And and that is exactly when I was doing all the the planning and plotting and developmental research for Moon of the Turning Leaves. Like I, I left CBC in May of 2020 and then, you know, spent the rest of that year doing all that planning, right? And I didn't start writing the first draft until January of 2021. So I was like going through all kinds of stuff in my head around the end of the world, around like, you know, this potentially fatal illness that was emerging around us about bringing another baby into the world, about, you know, understanding how, uh, how, and if Nishnabe values or ways of life could sustain after all this. And, and, you know, it was just such a, such a tumultuous time but you know having him come to us uh yeah he he guided us out of the darkness and um i'm just, we're all just so blessed to have him and and we've had a, our, our third son born since then too so two pandemic babies right uh you know it, it's been a joyful time for us you know we feel very fortunate so thanks for asking i i, I love talking about that part yeah and that kind of that kind of like leads six perfectly thank you all into like my second question which um is so i i had not read your first book prior to the book club being announced i read them back to back and i thought it was really interesting reading the first one knowing that that was written prior to the pandemic um and then the second one that you were working on during the pandemic so i'm kind of curious we mentioned already how the second one was influenced by that but looking back do you think that you may have approached the first story differently had you already experienced a pandemic i know that might be hard to to imagine maybe yeah um you know like that there have been other pretty prominent uh plagues uh in the last 20 years like i was living in toronto when sars happened um which was like coincidentally the same summer as a blackout actually uh and then you know the h1n1 flu ha uh, happened in like 2008 2009 i think um, but there was nothing like like uh, the way COVID-19 unfolded, right? Um, so, yeah, it probably would have changed how I approached the story, uh, how I would have approached Moon of the Crested Snow. Um, you know, I would have thought about, you know, Justin Scott or the others bringing sickness up into the community, right? Um, and, and I didn't think about that at all when I was first, uh, you know, developing that story. Uh, it, you know, it, it did have like, uh, an impact, obviously, as I mentioned on the second story, but when, um, when the, when the wheels really started turning on, on the second story was in the fall of 2019, that's when I met Rick Meyer, the editor, uh, my agent, Denise arranged a, a meeting with him and with Ann Collins, who's one of the publishers at Penguin Random House. Um, I happened to be in Toronto for for a concert in in November of 2019, and I said, I "Have a free afternoon, Denise. Uh, you know, if you want to meet for any other any reason, let me know." And she said, "Well, come. I can. I'm pretty sure I can get you a meeting with these Penguin Random House people. So come with your best idea for a sequel." And and I was like, "Okay, you know, no pressure, right?" <laughs> So I'd already been thinking about placing it into the future, you know, having it this quest story of, um, you know, returning home, but also trying to find answers uh, and more importantly, move on from, you know, the depleting landscape that they've been settled in for so long. Right. Uh, so, you know, I met with Rick and Anne. I said, this is my idea. And Rick said, OK, well, you know, let's have these check ins every once in a while and we'll see how the story is developing for you. So we would talk about once a month and and I would say, okay, here's where I see the story going here and here's the main characters and here's the bad guys and here's the setting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, and part of those discussions, I thought, okay, I would tell him, you know, there's going to be a big plague element to this. You know, once they um, come down, they're going to find out that everything's been mostly ravaged by this plague that like flourished in the aftermath of this blackout right and that was going to be a, a pretty big part of the plot so he finally offered me the contract the first week of march in 2020 and then the next week was when the pandemic was declared right so we i we talked on the phone right after that and i was like yeah man i think we should probably water down the whole plague thing and then maybe take <laughs> take that in a different direction so uh so there is like mention of various sicknesses in in the second book as you've seen but uh yeah it was going to be a bigger thing then so yeah we we changed direction and and i think like 
it ended up better. Um, I'm glad that I didn't spend a whole lot of time trying to write about a plague in the second book because that would have been you know, emotionally draining, especially in those first uh, first months in the spring and summer of 2020. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I think, yeah, the writing the first one now would, would be a different story for sure. Thank you. Miigwech. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so one maybe comment and then question. So uh comment. I read a I read a lot of dystopian books and specifically books about power going out seems to be a thing that I enjoy. Um <laughs> Are you a survivalist? No. Okay. No, I, I've been on that theme a couple of times, but yours is the first book that's included like nuclear meltdown stuff, which scared the so thank you for adding a new layer of, <laughs> of things for me to worry about so thank you very much um yeah the idea of like um like the earth you know you think you're gonna go back to the earth but then the earth is dead like that is mm -hmm. that thing scared me for a long time um but my question is i actually read moon of the crescent snow in print but then i listened to moon of the twin wings on audible and I really enjoyed the, narr uh, the narration. And I know I've talked to other authors that don't like the, the their narrator or they don't think they did a good job. And I'm just curious to see how much influence you had on, on any of that sort of production or if you had any influence on print versus um, audio. Yeah, good, good question. Thanks for bringing that up. I'll, I'll mention something quickly about the nuclear fallout. Um, you know, when I was talking about this mishmash of of things that would happen after the blackout with Rick and that we were going to include, um, he really latched on to that. And he's the one who really, I think, pushed me to um, go a little deeper into the potential for Fallout. Uh, and uh, it was his idea specifically, you know, when, you know, when they go into the city and they go into City Hall and they see all those notes um you know that i i that was always always what i wanted to do but he said you know you should also include like maps where somebody has come and written you know deadlands or dead zones or whatever right and i was like oh man that's such a such a cool idea and and rick is just so awesome just such an awesome editor so so i cre i credit him with just like adding that 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 additional piece that i think adds that creepiness or or you know boosts that fear factor um so yeah Full credit to him. Um, in terms of the audiobook, oh, you know, I just, I just love Billy so much. Uh, he is just such a treasure. When uh, Moon of the Crescent Snow was coming into development for audiobook uh, with with ECW Press, who published it, uh, they asked me if I wanted to do it, and I said, no way. <laughs> There's no way I want to do that um, because you know I'm not an actor, uh, but also I've looked at these words over and over again for years, and there's no way I want to read them all again for like, uh, in a professional way, you know? So they said, okay, you know, that's cool. Here's a list of actors that we're thinking of doing, uh, getting to do it. And Billy was on the list and, and I said, oh, I want him right away. Uh, because, you know, I'd seen him in films and TV shows. I'd seen him on the stage, uh, for decades prior to that, you know, he's been around for a while. And uh, they said, okay, yeah, we'll get Billy to do it. And uh, it was just so fun, you know, working with him because you know, he's Cree from Northern Manitoba originally and, and Cree and, and Anishinaabemowin or Ojibwe are, are pretty similar, right? So it wasn't a huge uh, lift for him to get the pronunciation uh, of, of a lot of those words down. But often he would be like in the recording booth in Toronto and he'd text me and he'd be like, oh, how do you pronounce this? So I'd like record it in, in my phone and then just send it back to him. Right. So that he could get the pronunciation done. Uh, so with Moon of the Turning Leaves, again, different publisher, different sort of um, way of doing audiobooks. Uh, but they asked me, do you want Billy again? And I said, yeah, 100 percent. I want him mostly for the sake of continuity, but also like. He breathes such uh, a new life into the story for the first one that I really wanted to hear how he would do that for the second one, too. 
And and I think it's an entirely different experience listening to him read the story uh, compared to reading it. Um, because I really wanted to try to write it in in a way that somebody could speak it to somebody else too. You know, um, I'm not trying to create literature that's you know challenging to read or or like artistic in a sort of uh, critical sense. You know, I want somebody to be able to engage with what they're reading as if somebody's speaking it to them. And he captures that so well, you know, and, and I just love what he did with the, with Moon of the Turning Leaves too. So, um, yeah, I did, I was able to choose him and I was able to sort of, uh, you know, work with him a little bit, but, you know, just having him do it is just such a gift. And I consider it like a huge privilege to have had him bring him, his talents to the stories overall. Good question. I'm going to go back and, and listen to the music. I want to sure. go back. I think, yeah, the language was one thing that I really liked being able to hear it. So it's, it's cool. Thank you. I've All right, on. Thank you. <laughs> other questions? If you have another question, you can ask another question because of Grant. Yeah. Do you feel free? They're burning. I'll ask I'll ask <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like we're at some weird meeting where I make you come to the front of city council. And... <laughs> um, do you have any favorite minor characters in the story? That you um, yeah, you know, uh, it, it was, it was really great to bring Tyler back. Um, you know, he, in, in the first story, he's part of this crew with, with Tyler and uh, I mean with, with uh, Evan and Isaiah, right? Um, one of my biggest regrets with Tyler in the first book is that I always imagined him to be a two spirit person. And when I was writing the story, I was like, is, is there room for me to have him come out? Like, is there room for me to write him as his true self? And I, I like, I, I shied away from it because I was just worried about not doing him or the two spirit experience justice. And, and I thought, okay, you know, like, um, he's just going to be a guy, a res guy, like, like the rest of the res guys. Right. And, and I really regretted that after it came out because there was not the sort of two spirit representation that I wanted in the story, you know? So when I had the opportunity to do the sequel, I was like, okay, here is my chance to write Tyler as he truly is, you know, with, with a partner. And, and it was, it was, I guess in a way it was kind of easier. Um, I didn't have to have him like come out to his friends or anything like that he's just there with his partner that he lives with you know uh and and i i really felt like he was more of himself in in the second book uh which was like you know um fulfilling for me because i i realized the potential that i wanted for him um and in the second book too i think that the character of jobdis um the guy who you know, is is the white passing Nishnabe guy who was with the disciples at first. Um, that was just really fun to try to explore because I wanted him to represent that moral ambiguity ambiguity that I talked about earlier. You know, like this is a guy who's able to sort of go in and out between different worlds. He's used that for his own survival. Um, now he wants to go home. Can he be fully trusted? You know, and 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 in the end, you know, we don't know for sure if if we could have trusted him all along, right? Uh, so yeah, it was cool to to sort of have him emerge and then come along with them along the way. But I think his his presence benefited the group more than it hurt them, even though like you know they did come across the disciples again and that resulted in death and so on like he he i think helped uh like he he saved their lives in the first sense right like they would have been killed in that cabin if he hadn't you know gone rogue against uh his 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 colleagues there right so yeah and i think like he he emerges when the story starts to get really violent which is like another and, you know, another factor can, to consider when writing it. But, um, yeah, he, he's one of my favorite sort of secondary characters, too. I couldn't decide if he was good or bad. I was convinced he was going to turn. My sisters were like, no, he's good. He's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, come on up. Um, Are you three sisters? Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, nice. Right on. Um, so I know that you touched earlier about your writing style and that you're a planner, um, but I too was surprised to read in the acknowledgement that this was not planned. 
So when you decided to do the book, was the end thing always going to be what you decided on? Yeah, great question. Um, with 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 Moon of the Crescent Snow, like I always like the ending was was always going to be the goal, right? Like I, no no matter what happened in between, I always wanted them to be like surviving and going and building a new settlement. I was like, okay, that's that's the finish line for me. So when I thought of Moon of the Turning Leaves, I was like, what's what's the finish line for this one? You know, it's going to be them um, even further into the future um in their homelands uh more i think more decolonized than than they had been at the beginning of the story and with the future more wide open than than in the beginning right so yeah i always that was always the, like the final scene that i wanted to get to you know even before i figured out like whose job this was or you know what was going to happen in the city or anything like that i was like okay i want both Nicole and Wawaskana, the little girl who's born at the beginning, to I want her to be, you know, a, a, almost a teenager now, uh, coming into her like coming of age um, ceremony, and uh, it's going to be a grandmother granddaughter moment um, in their in their homelands, their new homelands, but their traditional homelands at the same time. Uh, so, it, and that's like I think the most sort of futuristic or most speculative thing that I've ever written or or dreamed of. And it was just really exciting to try to get to that point. So the second thing I thought of um, was just how the opening birth scene was going to work, right? And and I always I always wanted to start it with a birth scene, um, mostly because there's so much death in the first book, and a birth really is that opportunity for regeneration, right? That that is the ultimate, I think, incentive to look towards the future and try to consider it in a hopeful way. And also, as mentioned, like I saw my son being born around the same time, right? And something similar happened, like he, he got stuck, his shoulder got stuck as as he was coming out, um, which was a very scary moment too. So, but you know, when you're a writer, you can sort of like, uh, dive into those firsthand accounts, right, that that you've seen. So, uh, but yeah, the 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 birth to the 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 birth of the girl to her becoming like uh, a fully formed young adult um those were the first scenes that i wanted to bookend the whole story with and then yeah i planned everything out in between all that thanks i'm shocked you haven't asked a question mm -hmm. no carlos <laughs> do you not have a question oh. <laughs> <laughs> He asks a question at every meeting, so I'm shocked that he's not asked a question. <laughs> nice to meet you, Bob. My name's Carlos. Um, like you, I read a lot of post-apocalyptic uh, fiction, so it's sort of funny when you were mentioning the books that you enjoyed, because I've read all of them. Um, I was telling Sam just as we were walking in that I, I like book club because it takes me out of my normal reading patterns, right? A little science fiction and fantasy yeah. and apocalyptic stuff. But this is a book, or both books. If I had known about them, I would have read them you know, a while ago, but yeah, I, I enjoyed both books very much. Uh, yeah, that was fun. No questions other than to say thank you. I mean, the books were fantastic. I guess I did have one question, which I'm surprised Sam didn't ask. Me, you know, <laughs> Burn! No, no, no. <laughs> Are you a full-time author now? And what's, what's coming next? Oh yeah, well thanks thanks for that, Carlos. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I I'm very fortunate that I was able to make the transition to being a full time author. Um, when I uh, when the prospect for this book was coming up in late 2019, I was working as uh, the afternoon radio host here in Sudbury, which was the best job I had at CBC. I, I just loved loved it every single day. Um, but I knew if, if I was going to be offered a contract to do the sequel, I would not be able to do it all at the same time, you know, especially with a growing family. Right. So I knew something had to give and, and, and I, it was going to be CBC, you know, uh, for better or worse. Right. Um, you know, when I worked as a, you know, when my last three books before that, were being written and published uh, you know i always of course asked permission from cbc to do that and then i would have to you know show them my contract that i was going to be signing with the publisher and so on right and they were always so great about it um as i mentioned they gave me time off to to do writing for like a month at a time and stuff like that 
But I knew with this one, because it was with a much bigger publisher and because there was going to be, um, you know, some some greater interest around it, that it just wouldn't all work out. And I, I was really uh, concerned whether they would uh, allow me to sign the contract. So I didn't even tell them. I just said, I'm, I'm quitting, <laughs> you know, sorry, guys. Uh, so so that that's how that started, you know, jumping off the mothership, as we say, right? Uh, but I just have such a great supportive partner. And she always said, you know, like, if you have the opportunity to become a full-time author, we should definitely go for that, you know? So the the conversations we had started in in the fall of 2019, you know, five or six months before I actually quit, and we talked about all the different ways that I'd be able to make income and and the various opportunities I would look into and so on. And I was really fortunate that uh, I was able to apply for a, a pretty big grant from the Canada Council for the Arts to to write the story, which I got right at the same time I was I was leaving uh, CBC. And then otherwise, like the royalties from Moon of the Crested Snow were, were really good too. You know, that that was another major part of my income. So for that first year, I was pretty set. And I was like, okay, I have this year to start working on the story. And then and then I'll start figuring out the other streams of income and so on, right? So, so yeah, I've been a full-time author for almost four years now. Uh, again, just so fortunate that it's worked out. You know, it's, it's not always going to work out this way. I fully recognize that. Like... I, I may end up having to, you know, work full time uh, again in in another field, but um, for now, I'm just really fortunate. And and as I say, as I said in the acknowledgments for Moon of the Turning Leaves, like this is all because of readers. This is all because of people like you. You know, I would not be where I am today without the enthusiasm for the first story and and just the people who take the time to read the the stories and and invite me to share about it so you know that's i want to express my gratitude to you all um what's coming next is i'm hoping to i'm starting to work on another novel outside of this world because uh i, I kind of want to take a break from the whole post-apocalyptic thing for a little while because i've been in it for almost the last 10 years and as fun and rewarding as it has been it's, it's still pretty dark at the same time so um i'm trying to write something a little more humorous uh at this point uh you know, I haven't quite figured out what the, I have a story that I'm, I've started, but I haven't quite figured out um, the finer details of it. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. And, and hopefully maybe I'll have something to share later this year about it. Uh, we'll see, but uh, yeah, I'm going to keep writing. We'll see how it goes. And, you know, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about the next one whenever it comes out. Yeah. Oh, and, and to answer a question I know is going to come, will there be a part three? Uh, maybe someday. I don't know. Uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said I said no the first time, and here we are talking about the second one. So I'm definitely not going to say no this time. Um, I do have like a very rough idea of what a part three could be, but it's going to take a lot of work, and and I'm just not prepared to do that work yet. You know, as mentioned, I want to write some something a little more fun and lighthearted first. And then, then we'll see what happens with a potential part three. Yeah. I was going to ask that. So you <laughs> I did really like that. You know, sometimes it's nice to sort of imagine where the story goes afterwards. I really appreciated that we got to see where you thought the story was, what was, did go. Right. I like that. So thank you again. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. I'm turning it around again. Okay, whoop, whoop. Um, a few questions before we let you go. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the best book you've read lately? Um, oh geez, well, uh, I read Bad Cree by Jessica Johns. Uh, oh, it's so good. So good. We read yeah. that for book club too, so everyone here yeah. has read it as well. Oh man, I, I I just loved it. It was awesome. Um uh i just read a book it's not out yet it's called the art of vanishing by lynn katsukaki um it's it'll be out in the spring it's like a historical novel about uh, japan in the 70s it's about art and and creativity and class um it was really good and i just started uh tommy orange's new book he's the author of uh there there it's called we read Walking that one too <laughs> what did you oh, nice. <laughs> holy geez like this this one it's, Was this it's, the Wandering you know, Star? Wandering Stars, yeah, yeah. It's it's wow. It's uh, I'm only about fifty pages in, but I'm 
pretty blown away. You know, I, I think it's shaping up to maybe be, maybe be more powerful than they're there, you know? So, yeah. Um, do you have a writing routine? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, since, um, you know, I, I started doing this full time, it's just basically write as much as possible when the kids are at school and daycare. So between the hours of like nine and four, uh, but, uh, yeah, I do. I usually start the day with a walk, you know, go out, you know, in my neighborhood or to the park. That's about a 15 minute walk away. Um, I do that before I start writing anything. And then then I'll start writing some stuff and, you know, maybe go through it for like an hour or two hours and then do something around the house like the dishes or, you know, folding laundry or shoveling snow or whatever else and then get back to it and then. Uh, yeah, I do it in like spurts, right? Like I don't just sit there for hours and hours at a time to write because I just, it's just not, you know, feasible for me to do that. Um, but yeah, you know, but part of the write, writing process too is like, is reading, you know, that's a huge part of it. Uh, watching movies, watching TV shows, listening to music, absorbing as much art as possible. I consider that part of my process too, uh, because everything is storytelling, right? You know? And it's just really important, I think, if you're going to be a storyteller to uh, engage with as many different artistic mediums as possible, you know, so so that's part of the process, too. That leads me to my last question. You have a lot of traditional songs in the book um, based on certain moments and, and traditional um, like special moments in in life, coming of age, death, etc. Mm -hmm. But if there was a soundtrack that was playing during these two stories, what musicians would you be drawn to to say they'd be on that soundtrack? Oh, geez. Like if, if there was, uh, you know, an actual uh, like series or film, um, there is a Nishnabe uh, musician named Melody McIver. They're a friend of mine uh, originally from uh, Northwestern Ontario. They live in Winnipeg now and they create this really cool like um kind of ambient kind of classical yet yeah, infused with like traditional music uh so they would be part of it you know but i also really like any any artist that's taking you know uh modern i guess genres if you could call them and infusing any anything quote-unquote traditional in it right so there's a Nishnabe uh musician from um close to here his name's evan red sky he he makes he, like Americana country-ish kind of music. Uh, that's really great. Uh, Leonard Sumner is a guy from Manitoba too, who does something similar to that. The Hallucination, obviously, you know, formerly a tribe called Reds, you know, I just love the, what they do. Um, basically any, anybody who's, you know, looking to the future, but also drawing upon the past, you know, uh, that's the spirit I really I try to capture in the books. And, and I think music can be a good, uh, good component of that too. It makes me happy that you had an answer for that. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you want to touch on or plug before we let you go since it is quarter to 10 where you are right now? Oh, geez. I don't know. Um, yeah. Am I going to, Oh, I'm going to be out in, um, in Moose Jaw for the festival of words. In, no way. In July. So, so if any of y'all are, are down that way, uh, yeah, come say hi, you know, when is uh, that? It's I think it's July, July 15th to 18th or something like that. Let me just pull up my calendar here. Uh, uh, Third week of July, I am told from yeah, the, July, uh, July 18th to 21st. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll be I'll be in in mm -hmm. your neck ish of the woods uh, in the summer. So that's one thing to plug for sure. Cool. OK, I will definitely put that in the book club so that people remember because people were really excited to hear you were coming. Um, Other than that. Thank you so much for the book and for your time tonight and for just being so great and open about everything. Um, we just so appreciate it. And we all had, I think we all had a good time. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sam. And thank you all for, uh, you know, just spending your time with the story. I know how much time it takes to read a novel. So the fact that you've done that with mine really means a lot to me. And just very honored to have been invited to meet with you all tonight. Uh, Chimiguesh, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Good luck with your kiddos.